in a bid to speak directly to the public, but without using the gaff-prone Prime Minister, Downing Street is breaking with convention to appoint a public-facing press spokesperson. Now, this is unusual in Britain. Normally, we don't have uh, employees of the government sort of standing and speaking publicly to newspapers. That's why you always hear things from anonymous sources or the Prime Minister's spokesperson said. They never appear in newspapers. In fact, it's part of the ministerial code that they shouldn't. Um, but Downing Street has decided that it wants to introduce a new role, basically based on the US press secretary, so someone who's employed by the government, to stand up in daily press conferences and field questions to journalists. Now, you can see why they want to do that. They sort of recognise that having um, sort of almost constant access to the public can be handy. Remember, it's sort of the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic when, um, you know, the Tories were doing really well in the polls, partly because of all that communication. Um, you can see why they want to do it more. You can also see why they want to employ someone instead of putting Boris Johnson in front of the cameras every day because he's really fucking up. Um, on Thursday, we found out who would be filling this role. It is current head of strategic communications for Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, former head of national news at ITV, and before that, political editor at Newsnight, Allegra Stratton. That's Allegra Stratton there speaking to Policy Exchange. And in securing this job, which I think gets you a 100K, 100,000 um, salary, Stratton follows in the long, noble tradition the Vistaka, it's, it's not a noble tradition, of people going from working in political journalism to working for the people who they were supposed to be holding to account. Right, so political journalists going to work for politicians. Um, Newsnight, ITV, Rishi Sunak, Prime Minister. It's a bit of a conveyor belt there from political journalism to basically doing PR for journalists. You might ask whether there's much difference in the first place. Um, she was political editor at Newsnight between 2012 and 2015. Then she went on to become head of national news for ITV. And since April, yeah, she's been working with Sunak. Um, she also happens to be married to James Forsyth, who is political editor at The Spectator, he himself is best friends with Rishi Sunak, who was the best man at their wedding. Um, so Rishi Sunak was the best man at Allegra Stratton's wedding. So it sort of shows you how tight knit, how tightly knit um, the sort of establishment of politicians and um, journalists, which of course is unhealthy for democracy because you know, you're, you're not likely to be as tough a reporter when you're speaking to someone who was the best man at your wedding, or when you're speaking to someone who you think might be employing you in a year's time, um, which as head of ITV News, head of, head of national news at ITV, she would have been reporting on these politicians who she presumably had in the back of her mind she might go and work for in a moment. But I want to get down to what she was like as a journalist. This is relevant, actually, because I think she is here doing um, some sort of PR for the government. Uh, in 2012, in the middle of George Osborne's war on anyone who claims benefits. Explain to me, you are, just tell me a bit about your situation. You've got a daughter or a son? Daughter, yeah. She's going to be three next month. Um, we live together, we live um, just me and her. Um, I got that accommodation, not through the council, but I found it myself and then applied for housing benefits separately. Um, You're on housing benefit. You get help from the state for your housing. Don't you think that you should have possibly lived at home? until the point at which you could support your own house? Well, um, I, I find that living at home with my mum just wouldn't be an option really, space-wise. There's not enough space for... How you know, big's her flat or house? She does have a two-bedroom flat. It doesn't sound to me like your house and your mother's house, your mother's flat, is a bad place. So it's a choice you're making and it's a choice that comes with a price tag attached. Um, yes, it's, it's a choice, but at the same time, you know, I, I don't think living in my mum's house would have been, it, it wouldn't have been constructive. But, I mean, we know, we, we both know people that are living with their parents, they don't have a job, um, and they have fights, that's what happens, but they don't have a financial choice. Um, I think this... That's the difference, because I'm asking for help towards, I'm not asking for a free hand. Now that is just painful to watch, it's horrible to watch. She was political editor at Newsnight, right? She wasn't just some low-level journalist who was told to do something by her producer. She was political editor at Newsnight. And she was doing an interview in the middle of, you know, George Osborne's, you know, catastrophic um, war on the poor. 
his his austerity policy, which was you know backfired. It wasn't a smart policy. She, as political editor, should have been interrogating the government on this policy, which didn't work. When she's interviewing people who are you know suffering from cuts to benefits. I mean, she should really be asking them about their experience. Yeah, of course, she can do some pointed questions if she wants. But that interview was just a setup. You know, it's just, what, what, have you ever thought about living with your mom? I mean, with, has, has Allegra Stratton ever thought about living with her mom? You know, she, she, she's a privately educated woman, married to a privately educated man. I'm sure they're incredibly comfortable. She sits in front of a single mom and sort of, I mean, basically bullies her live on air. Really, really unpleasant to watch. Now, you might say, look, perhaps she wasn't saying truth to power, but at least she was saying some sort of truth. You know, the public do get annoyed at people who are unemployed, but accept lots of money, lots of taxpayers' money um, in benefits. The problem with that, it wasn't only distasteful, it wasn't only unpleasant, it was also inaccurate. It was also incredibly misleading. Now, in that interview, she made out, Allegra Stratton made out that her interviewee, Shanine Forp, was unemployed. She said, you know, there are people who they don't work. Um, why should they? they? They don't work. They have kids. Why should they be able to claim benefits? The implication was, you know, this is why should you be able to cl claim benefits? It turns out that's completely false. Shanine Thorpe actually has a full-time job. Um, she has a full-time job, but she had to claim housing benefits because she lives in East London where rents are astronomical, extortionate, probably because of you know, people who went to school with Allegra Stratton are making loads of money um, speculating on East London property prices. But in any case, um, she was getting a third of her, her rent from, from the government, which had been cut, making her life very difficult. And it was such an outrageous misrepresentation of what went on that Shanine Forp complained about this. 50,000 people signed a petition and the BBC had to apologise for the misrepresentation. Let's take a look at the apology. Um, so this was a few weeks after the original interview aired. And now for an apology. On the 23rd of May, during an item on welfare reform, we broadcast an interview with Shanine Thorpe that unfairly created the mistaken impression that she was unemployed and wholly dependent on benefits and suggested that she was living off the state as a lifestyle choice. She's asked us to make clear she has been in work or in work-related education since leaving school. Shortly after the programme, we published an apology on our website for the unmerited embarrassment and any distress the item caused her. We're happy to make this broadcast apology as well. So that's how you get ahead in, in political journalism. Obviously, Allegra Stratton got a, a, a higher level job in journalism after doing that. She stitched up a young woman who was, I mean, I, I shouldn't just say a young woman on benefits because she was a young woman who was working full time but had to have her rent topped up by the state because landlords were charging such extortionate rent. So a woman on benefits is not actually a good description for Shanine Forbes. Um, not that I think, you know, if someone was purely living off benefits, that would be particularly a problem because you know, the job market isn't particularly rosy at the moment. Um, but in any case, that's terrible journalism. So bad they had to apologize. She then gets promoted or hired in a higher level job by ITV as national news editor. And then she ends up working for, surprise, surprise, the Tories. I would say she was doing PR. She was doing public relations for a, for a conservative chancellor back in 2012. She's just doing it officially now because what she was doing there was basically feeding in, backing up George Osborne's narrative that people who are on benefits don't deserve them. And she was doing it in the cheapest, meanest possible way. Now, finally, I've got some sort of final bit of evidence for you when it comes to this particular interview, because you might be watching this thinking you're having a go at someone who's doing their job. Maybe it was Allegra Stratton's producer who sort of made her ask these awkward questions. You know, you often see this when people complain about the sun. You know, don't complain about the journalists. It's a difficult job market. I want to get a uh, section of a Private Eye article from the time. Um, so this was after the apology had been made and Private Eye reported on the circumstances in which that interview took place because it seems, you know, Stratton actually did find um, the person who she interviewed. So let's get this up. The lofty Stratton had earlier dismissed other potential interviewees off offered up by Tower Hamlets Council, including a couple with four children who had, lost, who had both lost their jobs and faced having to move out of London. You must have got people living on benefits as a lifestyle choice, she demanded of a harassed council staff. For good measure, she then shouted across a crowded open plan office floor that people should think about whether they can afford kids before they have them. One, you read that and you think, that's shocking, appalling, you know, that a political editor at Newsnight would, would say such a thing. Two, you think it's absolutely no wonder that she's become Boris Johnson's spokesperson. Yeah, I mean, that was an absolutely appalling, disgusting interview. And if that journalist was worth her salt, um, she would be sitting down with that woman's employer and asking why her employer does not pay high enough wages to cover the rent for her and her child. 
and accepting handouts from the government in the form of undercutting their workers so much that they have to then, on top of full-time work, claim housing benefits from, from the government. That's what she'd be doing if she was actually doing her job, rather than haranguing this poor woman and ask, and telling her that even though she herself is a parent, and you know, parenthood is difficult enough without living in cramped housing, um, but that's because, and I want to make it really clear here, that just because the BBC issued an apology does not mean that this was a one-off mistake or that Stratton is one kind of bad apple or one extreme case. All she did was she said the quiet part out loud. This is the ideological underpinning of the journalist class. And that is a consequence of multiple different things. It's a consequence of the fact that as we have a shrinking in publicly funded media, we instead have reliance on sort of clickbait, um, sort of uh, scoop style journalism, which relies on very close relationships with the political elite, um, rather than sort of long form investigative work. And it's also a consequence of the fact that journalism has basically become a, a type of work that is exclusively for privately educated, very wealthy people. You know, when you look into the stats, the, I think it's something like around like 70% or something of journalists are privately educated, which is so little in comparison to the, to the amount of the proportion of the public that are, that are publicly educated. So that kind of class, that lack of working class representation and the fact that you have to be so close to political elites and to capital. And as I say, you know, the British state is not just the politicians, it's also the kind of media class and the cap and capital sort of which have their, their embed who which are embedded in the state and which the state is embedded in them. But also, you know, we have this kind of and I'm no I'm not invested in this concept that all journalists should be neutral. I think that being neutral is sort of a bit of a, a fallacy. Um, but you can be a little bit more neutral than this. Like, come on, or you can at least have a diversity of ideological representation. But also we have this issue here, this revolving door between politicians and media um, figures and uh, uh, capital, which clearly presents serious issues when it comes to um, the idea that the media should hold power to account. And that is why Allegra Stratton is not a bad apple. That is why she represents actually the norm within the media class uh, in, in Britain and why she's reached such a high position, her and her husband, is because she reflects these structural conditions that have been developing in the media um, and the media industry over the past few decades. In case you're watching this and thinking, you know, we're, we're, we're extrapolating a bit too much from this one case. Yes, one person who was political editor at Newsnight and then head of national news at ITV went on to work for the Chancellor and the Prime Minister. But that's just one case. It's not. So this revolving door is a really systemic thing. So I'll give you just a few examples. So in 2011, Craig Oliver went straight from the job as editor of BBC Six O'Clock and Ten O'Clock News, so actually the most important news programme on the BBC, to be David Cameron's director of communications. In 2012, Fia Rogers went from being the BBC's lead politics producer to become George Osborne's comms chief. Then in 2017, this is the one you've probably heard of, um, Robbie Gibb went straight from a job as head of political programming at the BBC to be Theresa May's director of communications at number 10. So you've got all of these people who are literally in charge of, of political broadcasting, political programming. They should be holding the government to account, going straight on to work for the government. There's not even a cooling down period. I mean, you could at least you know, go away and work as an academic for a year or something become, before coming back to work for, for politicians. No, they just go straight from that job to working for a politician and it's seen as completely unproblematic. Obviously the problem with this, as I've sort of intimated before, if you think you're gonna get a job with a politician, you're gonna be less tough on them. You, you don't want to make an enemy of someone who you think might employ you in future. The other problem is once journalists go and work for politicians, they are going to be able to get favours from their old organisations, right? So if you are former head of political programming at the BBC, it's going to be easier for you to call up your mates at the BBC and say, I'm not you know, sure that you've um, framed this interview of Theresa May in a particularly fair way. Can you please change it? Um, I've got a, a case study, uh, which is from this week and involves Allegra Stratton. Um, so this is an interview ITV did with Rishi Sunak on Tuesday. If you're a professional musician, what is your message right now? If they can't earn enough money to live, is your message to them, you're going to have to get another job? 
I think, as, as I've said, it, it, my, my simple message to everybody is we're trying to do everything we can to protect as many jobs as possible. But they don't think you but, are. But, in that sector, they just don't I, think well, you I, are, I, 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 Look, it's, it's a very sad time. Three quarters of a million people have already lost their jobs. Uh, we know that, and uh, that, that is likely to increase, and many more people will. I, I can't pretend that everyone can do exactly the same job that they were doing at the beginning of this crisis, and that's why we've put a lot of our extra resource into trying to create new opportunities for people. So our Kickstart scheme, for example, uh, for young people who are most at risk of becoming unemployed uh, all the way up to the age of 24 are going to benefit from a fully funded job placement. But that's a, new, that's a different job, isn't yeah. it? That's you saying, that, that, go and get a different job. That, that, that is fresh and new opportunity for people. That's exactly what we, we should be But we're doing. a country that we've created so many fabulous mu- musicians and, and artists and actors. Uh, and you're effectively saying, look, I know it's hard, but maybe I'm getting another I, job. I think, I think probably you're, you're not being quite right in that there is no work available for, the, for everyone at all. I mean, for as, often enough, there isn't. Uh, it, as, as in all walks of life, everyone's having to adapt. So I, I'm getting the emails and seeing how theatre companies are adapting and putting on different types of performances. Uh, it is possible to do theatrical performances online as well and for people to engage with them that way and for new business models to emerge. Uh, plenty of music lessons are still carrying on. The same thing happens uh, certainly in my household and elsewhere. So, I, you know, yes, can things happen in exactly the way that they did? No, but everyone is having to find ways to adapt and adjust to the new reality, uh, and that's what we all have to do. And that's why we're allowing that to happen, but also sure. providing new opportunity for people if that's the right vehicle for them. This is an aside, actually, but I just think that's a completely bizarre interview. Like, uh, the idea that people who are musicians, or, or whatever, he says people in all walks of life should find new jobs just because we're about to have a lockdown during the winter just seems bizarre. Why would you retrain as, you know, a top violinist to become, well, I mean, there aren't really any jobs for people to go to anyway. There's mass unemployment. It's completely incoherent. But anyway, that's not what I want to focus on. I want to focus on how ITV framed this story and Allegra Stratton's relationship to it. Um, so initially, um, ITV reported that interview as Rishi Sunak suggests musicians and others in arts should retrain and find other jobs. Um, now that is, you know, it's potentially a slightly misleading headline. You know, it's there are many ways that you could frame that interview. That's one that's a bit more of a reach. Um, so he responded to a, to a question about people in the arts by saying, well, you know, all sorts of people will have to retrain. Now, obviously, if you're watching that and you're an artist, that he hasn't offered any reassurance. You know, it's been put it's been put to him that there are worried artists who might lose their jobs, and he said, well, all sorts of people will have to get new jobs. But he hasn't said, you know, artists will have to get new jobs. So obviously they've pushed back. Rishi Sunak's office have pushed back. And then ITV, they retract it. So they changed the headline. An earlier tweet about this story has been deleted and the article has changed to reflect that the Chancellor's comments were made about employment generally and not specifically about the music or arts sectors. This is quote tweeted by Sunak. So an earlier ITV politics tweet falsely suggested I thought people in arts should retrain and find other jobs. I'm grateful they have now deleted that tweet. Um, And this is retweeted by Allegra Stratton. So as I say, in terms of ITV retracting this, it's not the most unreasonable thing to happen in the world. I mean, I think the headline wasn't really misleading because if you are an artist who's in danger of losing your job, Rishi Sunak is essentially telling you, well, go find a new job, right? But they did in a way put words into his mouth. But the fact, you know, the fact that he could get it changed so quickly and someone who is working for him in a top job, used to be head of national news at ITV. It gets changed immediately. Then he tweets out celebrating, oh yeah, of course, actually I care about the arts, which is why I've given them this much money. It then gets shared by Allegra Stratton. I mean, the whole thing just seems odd. It seems incestuous. You have, you know, the networks that are going on there where Allegra Stratton is head of comms. They've got a headline they don't like. She can call up her mates at ITV. And we have to compare this to how the mainstream media treat left-wing politicians who tend to not have um, comms chiefs who used to have high-powered positions at the BBC for obvious reasons. So let's take, for example, Jeremy Corbyn. Um, Now, there were many misleading headlines about Jeremy Corbyn and actually misleading um, presentations of interviews. Now, the most egregious example of this was Laura Koonsberg, who in 2015, she basically stitched up Corbyn. It was an interview about terrorism, the report on BBC News made it out as if um, Corbyn had said he wouldn't shoot to kill people in the Paris style attacks. It turned out that actually Laura Koonsberg had flipped the questions and the answers to make it seem like Corbyn's answer about not shooting to kill had been about the Paris attacks when actually that was an answer to a different question. Now, the BBC did apologise for this, but it was only after two years 
you know, after it had gone all the way to the top via the proper processes um, to the BBC or the, the chairs of the BBC or whatever. There was no one who could just call up the BBC and make it happen because Seamus Milne doesn't have as much leverage with those people because he's not particularly from that world. Now, it seems obvious to me that as a politician, one of the reasons you want to employ former top journalists, you want to employ people who are head of political programming at ITV, is because you think they can pull strings in those environments. They can call up their friend if there's a headline they don't like. Those kind of things aren't available to politicians outside of that you know, milieu. And that is ultimately a flaw in our democracy. We need different politicians to have the same access to accountability in our media if it just depends on whether the person you employ was also the best man at someone else's you know it's it's not right finally we're going to finish this story by looking at the people who don't think this is a problem so who doesn't think a revolving door between the media and politics is a problem it's not a surprise other political journalists um, so when um, Allegra Stratton was announced as the new press secretary for Downing Street there was obviously you know some uproar some of this focused on the fact that she's married to James Forsyth, although only actually only a small part of it. Um, and this was jumped upon by sort of centre-right journalists. So Matthew Dancona, he was former deputy editor of the Sunday Telegraph, then editor of the Spectator, then Guardian columnist. Um, so he tweeted, anyone who has ever had contact with Allegra Stratton knows that she richly deserves and is more than qualified for her new role, on which congratulations. She also happens to be married to the very talented James Forsyth, with whom I worked at the Spectator. Each of them has a very successful career, not unusual. It is appallingly sexist to suggest that Allegra Stratton's appointment is anything other than her own achievement. Achievement. And I don't believe that there would have been comparable sniping at a male appointee. He goes on. There is plenty to criticise about this government, but it is quite wrong to direct fire at talent duly rewarded, sending Allegra best wishes. Now, the problem here, I mean, to be honest, I didn't really see anyone saying she got the job because of James Forsyth. And the reason I wouldn't think it is because she was more successful than James Forsyth. This wasn't like she, doors were open to her because she was married to the editor of The Spectator. I mean, head of national news at ITV, that's a better job than political editor at The Spectator. So this idea that people are saying, oh, she's just living in James Forsyth's shadow is a bit ridiculous. The, the relevant point is that Rishi Sunak was the best man at her wedding when she was head of news at, head of national news at, at ITV. It's about the close wedding, you know, this, this nexus of the media and politicians all being from among the same cosy establishment. That's what people are complaining about. That's what Matthew Dancona can't see because presumably he's part of it as well. To say it's irrelevant that Rishi Sunak was the best man at her wedding when she's head of you know, news at, at ITV, that's just to put your head in the sand. And this is a strategy that you know, establishment journalists and people in the establishment use generally, which is to say, you cannot focus on our personal lives because that's either uncouth or it's sexist or it's whatever, when actually their personal lives are really quite relevant if it means that they are incredibly close to the people who they are supposed to be holding to account. Thank you